Thank you so much. Uh, welcome. This is going to be uh, Building Micro Frontends with Stencil.js. Uh, my name is Michel Tobon. I am a senior front end engineer at Amazon. Actually, as of December 1st, I am a senior front end engineer at Amazon. I come from uh, south of the border in Mexico. And fun fact about myself during the pandemic, I decided to take on learning how to play the ukulele. And uh, I cannot stress this enough. It is uh, great to create music, so try it yourself. Before I begin, though, I would love to thank uh, Ionic for inviting me today. And uh, of course, you for watching and tuning in. Thank you for, for, thank you for making it. I really hope that you like today's presentation. So what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about micro frontends, what micro frontends are and how they are defined, and what are the elements that they require uh, to build them. We're going to talk about some different approaches to build micro frontends. Uh, we're going to touch a bit on what are web components and how can we implement the construction of micro frontends with Stencil.js. Uh, we're also going to be talking about the opportunities that this uh, approach brings us and all of the benefits as well. Uh, and we're going to do all of this with the help of our made up uh, company called uh, smallnews.com. Uh, so let's focus on uh, smallnews.com. So imagine that in the beginning, uh, this was a small startup with about five to 10 employees, right? It's uh, probably a group of friends uh, got together and decided to create this website. And initially, they were able to deliver content at a very slow pace. There was no problem for them. They maintained uh, this delivery pace you know, steadily. And because of this, uh, initially, probably they had a very simple architecture. They probably just had a database, a simple backend to pull and, and push uh, data into it. And they had a front end, right? Originally, they had very little sections in their website, a manageable amount of routes uh, to, to send the user to, a controlled content delivery system. And uh, because of this, they were able to simplify their architecture. And something very important to note about architecture is you have to have the architecture that can support your business. But at the same time, you have to have the right business to justify an architecture. So at this stage of their life, potentially even a monolithic architecture makes sense for small news outcome. So probably their, their website looked like this with a home site with some different sections, very little of them and a news detail site, right? But what happens when you start taking the right decisions? So probably small news to, uh, started taking the right decisions. More people started tur turning their faces towards small news. They started doing things right. And when you do things right, growth is inevitable. Now, uh, the small news uh, had more sections and probably each one of those sections needed their own specific content. Probably each one of those sections also needed its own different style, something unique for each one of them. And because of that, more business unit ha units have to come in play. They had to hire more engineers to maintain those business units. And with that, of course, more problems. So now small news became big news. And big news now is very big. Let's say that it has over 10,000 employees globally and uh, 100,000 employees, I don't know. They have to serve millions of customers at this uh, uh, at very fast pace. And now they have multiple sections and business units that appear every single day. New ideas are coming into big news and they have to be maintained. Because of this, maintaining the ownership of each one of those elements is really complicated. Now, uh, even deploying changes is really slow because there are multiple sources of truths and databases that have to be carefully merged. And adding a single, uh, a single uh, feature to specific portions of this application is complicated because you can break anything in another part of the application, right? And outages can happen at all times because now you have a very complex application that has a lot of moving parts. And if any of them has to change, you know, they could break something even remotely related to it. So probably big news found out that it was going to be simpler to separate the ownership of their business uh, by 
uh, several different verticals, right? So potentially they had uh, a home section, a detail section, a sports section, an event section, and other sections. And each one of those organizations uh, had a delimited ownership of their business and their requirement. So instead of the whole team controlling the front, back, and database for all of them, uh, now each one of those elements had the independence to do that. And all of these microsite, uh, microsites would be routed under the same website, which would be something like bignews.com, right? So now we start talking about micro frontends. So what are micro frontends? Micro frontends are architectural patterns that allow to divide a frontend application into multiple independent uh, portions. Luca Metzalero in his, in his book, uh, Building Micro Frontends, defines micro frontends as a collection of decentralized artifacts that integrate into the same website. And he also defines a way to create uh, a framework to create micro frontends in general. First, we have to define what are going to be the units that need to be decentralized. Then now we have to compose all of the, those units to make them work together. We have to have a consistent and reliable way to root each one of those artifacts in order to achieve interconnection and at the same time interdependence. And we have to have a reliable way to communicate all of them together. So now the big news uh, site looks something like this with different pages and uh, probably each one of them is its own micro universe, right? But let's think about the use case of bignews.com. Imagine that uh, I am a very big uh, fan of sports, which you know I may or not be. Uh, so I want to go to the sports ball championship game uh, between the Seattle athletes and the Chicago sportsmen. And I got myself tickets and plane tickets, and I am really excited to go there. But here's the problem. I don't know what to wear. And, uh, and probably, uh, because I don't know the weather in another city, right? So I could use the... Uh, the weather section in big news. That sounds about right. So I have to go and click this tiny unit over there. And then I have to go and find the other sections. And probably the weather section is buried uh, under another hundred sections because big news is so big. And now I have to go to the big news weather section and I have to change the location to Chicago, Illinois. And then I have to change the date to when this is happening. And then I have to wait for the data to load. And then I will get the information that I actually wanted. I mean, that worked, but here's the thing. It would have been way simpler for me as a user if this information was shown to me consistently right where I actually needed it. So this gives us a very good opportunity to define a micro front end uh, because the same weather widget could potentially be displayed in the home play, in the home page, in the detail page, uh, maybe want to know the weather at you know like particular place when something happened uh, in the sport uh, section as well. It can happen. Uh, uh, big, we just show uh, an example. Maybe in the event section, I want to know what is going to be the weather for that festival I got tickets for, and you know a lot of other use cases that I was just too lazy to think of. Uh, but here is the problem with very large applications. We have independence. And uh, with independence, every single one of those elements can have, can have the, the full decision of deciding of what stack they're going to be using. So in this particular case, the home section is uh, written with pure HTML. The detail section is with React, sports in view, events in Angular. This is obvi uh, obviously an exaggeration, but these things can happen, right? And because of this, uh, each one of those verticals can have their own stack and their own architecture. Maybe even one of those, uh, each one of those uh, verticals is also a micro front end. They might be uh, created with module federation or using something like Lattice, for instance, uh, probably even reverse proxies. It is all possible, right? So how can we potentially get that data from the weather service and display it? Potentially the home uh, team, the home service could pull the data from the weather service and display it in its own way. That may, that may work. Uh, then the detail section would have to do the same and the sports section would have to do the same and every other section would have to do the exact same thing. 
So every team will have to pull their own data and implement their same front end in their own way, which leads to inconsistencies, right? It is not the same widget everywhere. So there's cognitive load. It is complicated to understand that the weather looks different in here than in there. And then all services change over time. So what happens when the weather service decides to be updated because of security issues, because of uh, new databases, new anything, right? Now, every single team who depends on that service has to update their code. And all of that costs a lot of money because we are coding the same thing over and over. It's code that looks very similar for each one of these cases. So let's analyze the numbers for this. So let's be optimistic and say that it takes about one week on, uh, on uh, effort in the back end and one week of effort for the front end. So we land with about two weeks of effort. That's not terrible, right? But let's think that about 50 teams are using this same approach. That means we are using 100 weeks of effort. If there are 52 weeks per year minus vacation, we can say that Big News paid the full annual salaries of two engineers in code repetition. Two engineers that basically were coding the exact same thing every single week. So this is definitely not something that scales. There's gotta be a better way to do this. So let's try to find another way to route this micro front end. Potentially, the weather team can own components that can render in any instance, right? So probably they had uh, a, a jQuery plugin that can render in that HTML application, pull its own data from uh, the weather service, that could work. Probably they have a re React, a Vue, an Angular component that can do the same thing. I mean, this would work, but with this, we have a lot of problems. Now we have to integrate with multiple frameworks. And because of that, now we have a lot of code bases that we have to maintain. This is going to inflate their development times. And with that, every single deployment is going to take a lot of time because these are build dependencies. Whenever you make a change to your components, all of your consumers have to actually uh, consume those changes and deploy them themselves. This leads to a lack of independent testing. How can I isolate each one of those components and test that all of my changes actually worked? This is complicated, and it needs, uh, this creates a need for extensive communication. Now, product owners have to talk to other product owners, and it is no longer a matter of just consuming that information, right? There has to be a better way to do this. Let's talk about web components then. What are web components? Web components are natively supported, standardized JavaScript units that are completely framework agnostic. And they can simplify sharing and reusing experiences because they transport their own markup, style, and logic with them. And they are ideal to deploy reusable patterns such as design systems, uh, small experiences like a tax calculator or something like that, or something even more complex like an actual micro front end. They're a very good way to avoid repetition. I like to talk about web components as a way to teach new tags to HTML. So probably now the weather team can create a web component that looks a bit like this, right? It is a new tag that uh, has, uh, that is going to receive a location and a date amongst other things. Probably we can even think about uh, another hundred things that we can throw into this configuration. And this particular component is going to pull its own data from the backend and display the result. But here's the problem about web components. They're complicated. Uh, first, we have to create a class that extends the HTML element. Now we have to define and mount a shadow DOM. We have to add styles to the components, probably style tokens as well. We have to add markup with strings or by creating and maintaining uh, HTML elements by hand. We have to maintain also the state and re-render the component based on it. Uh, we have to define the events, the methods, and the attributes that this particular component is going to receive amongst any other complications, right? So web components are low level by design. This is very important because web components are very close to the DOM. It is very important for them to be this low level in order for us to be able to build bigger things upon them. 
That's where Stencil.js comes in. Stencil is a compiler that generates web components and it was created to be the core for the Ionic framework. And it provides a very familiar development experience. So if you are a programmer who, are, who is very savvy on React, you know about 90% of what you need to know to create web components with Stencil.js. And what you're gonna end up with is a native and framework agnostic web component that you can use then anywhere. These components are gonna have a clear and defined method of communication inside and out because they are strongly typed as well. The other great thing about uh, using Stencil is lazy loading. If you created a hundred components and only two of them are actually rendered at the same uh, time uh, at a page, only those two are the ones that are gonna be loaded into, into, your, uh, into your page. And it provides also with bindings for common frameworks such as React, Angular, or Vue. This is a great way for us to use the browser as the actual integration layer for micro frontend. So how could we leverage on stencil compiled components to create micro frontends? Well, let's go back to the drawing board now. Now we can think that uh, the weather team has created these web components with stencil and the result is a series of JavaScript files that they deploy to their own uh, CDN. So this content delivery network, it is owned and operated by them and they maintain it and they update it. And then because we're talking about something as simple as JavaScript files, obviously we can use something as logical as a script tag to deploy that same experience to absolutely each and every one of the other experiences that are going to be using it. So now that same component or that same uh, version component is going to be deployed to the actual front end of all of those uh, same elements, because now they're bound. They're bound by your React bindings, by your view bindings, or by simple HTML. And each and every one of those components are gonna go and pull their own data based on that configuration and render consistently. Now, let's talk about a consideration about this approach. It is very important to prefetch the components from the start. So wherever you're gonna use them, try to have them ready. You have to allow your components to be styled and customized, right? It is important to have like style tokens, something like that. You have to establish a strategy for version control. It is very important if a particular team requires to lock within a certain version, you have to, to allow them to do that. It is very important to have a very strict cache strategy, particularly in your CDN. I recommend personally to limit your communication to props and events. You can use methods because uh, they are actually really good, something like, uh, like focus or blur. But the problem with methods is that they work in a separate line than an application works normally. So they can break your application's life cycle. You have to be careful with them. And you have to keep your component-based micro frontends small. Remember of separation of concern. Do not try to own an entire consumer space. And then, very important, integration tests everywhere. Uh, at circuit breakers, if any of those uh, break, right? So you have to have robust integration tests between your component uh, and your backend. You have to test the integration between your components and the frameworks that you use. And you have to test and make sure that your consumers are also testing their integration between their pages and your components. So in conclusion, Micro frontends are architectural patterns that allow for independent development. And you can mix and match patterns to fit different business needs that you may have. And this is because software architecture is not a one line, it is about trade-offs. You have to define uh, what is the architecture that is going to be better to serve your particular uh, system or your particular business. Big organizations can become chaotic even when you separate the ownership of a very large application. Web components can be leveraged to standardize micro frontends in this particular way. And Sensor.js is a tool that is going to allow us to simplify the creation and maintenance of those web components. And this is going to simplify natively injective web component-based micro frontends 
into multiple architectures that you can find, even multiple micro front-end architectures layered one on top of the other. And finally, this is going to allow us to use the browser as a very powerful and very simple way to integrate micro front-ends and external communication into different, uh, into different ways. Let's, let me just tell you that micro front-ends are really not new. We have actually been trying to inject information from one side to another for a very long time. So this is just another way to do that. My name is Michel Tavon. Thank you so much. I, am, uh, uh, I really enjoyed uh, talking to you today. I hope that you liked my talk. This is my, my LinkedIn, so be, be free to, uh, to follow me there. And I'm also in the Stencil Slack, so feel free to ping me.